I think for some of you anyways, it's welcome back. And uh, we, we've kind of divided up our topic here in, in two sessions that could be thought of. This doesn't have a light, does it? It's like a cloud went over in here. Um, anyway, we divided our topic up in our consideration of the history of American Protestant education, Protestant progressive education, uh, particularly in terms of its origins and its rationale as it developed in the latter part of the 19th century and first part of the 20th century. Uh, and we tried to provide a little bit of a window uh, concerning... That really helps. That helps a lot. I, there, I, I did 16-point type, but it was even disappearing. <laughs> there, that saved me. Um, uh, from the what's to the so what's. And so ours here is kind of a, uh, an evaluative session. I'd like to review just a little bit for some who may not have been at our first session some of the things that we covered at our first under the quote what's, what was it, and uh, uh, what did it accomplish uh, before we get into, did I do right? Yes, sir. I did, okay, good. Took a few times to do it, but I got there. Problem solving. Um, uh, before we get into our evaluative element, and I want to use the evaluative element as a springboard for us to take in not just simply whatever we've been doing in this sectional, but our entire conference, as well as things that I know you have been wrestling with for some time. Uh, our fundamental question here that our conference is focusing on, and that is the question to be asked of us in relationship to our children, uh, in our families, in our parishes, and so forth. Why educate? To what end? To what purpose? If we have surveyed, of course, the goals and objectives, and we're going to uh, uh, assess them a little bit here now, of, of uh, mostly 20th century progressive education, we want to turn that nevertheless in to ourselves uh, and ask the question, why educate? It seems to me that until that question has clarity, you are not in a position to answer the question, well then, how best to educate? You can only evaluate the various options of how best once you have some sort of a clear idea about what it is that you would be seeking to accomplish. So I would like to use some of our session here to come let us reason together, uh, uh, or traditionalism, if you'd like that, uh, posing the two, as Dr. Koff did, uh, to ponder that basic question. Because classical Lutheran education presumes an answer to that question, why educate? Because we wish to say, well, this is, this is the best how. Well, okay. The best how to what? Mm -hmm. What is our answer to the question, why educate, to which we would wish uh, our people to consider, and this is the best way to do it. Okay? So we're going to use... Looking at progressive education is a springboard for pondering the same kinds of questions that they pondered, but perhaps clarifying different goals and objectives, uh, seeing, therefore, being able to compare uh, in a meaningful way uh, contemporary progressive education, where it's at, and it's not where it was when it began, uh, and what we think we ought to be about and why. Okay, a little bit of review here, though. In our previous session, we endeavored to survey the advent of compulsory government-sponsored progressive education as it, was, as it was conceived and gradually implemented during the latter part of the 19th and first part of the 20th century. We indicated that it was developed in response to utopian visions to harness coal and later petroleum 
to achieve an unparalleled material standard of living for Americans. Through scientifically managed mass production, the goals, means, and results have often been called the Industrial Revolution, which began in England and Germany during the first half of the 19th century and in the United States during the latter part of that century. Our vision of a material utopia and the means and methods to produce it were largely borrowed from the Germans and to some extent then also the English. One of the most important elements for success <coughs> was to raise up an efficient and effective mass labor force that would both produce the cornucopia of quickly obsolete goods and consume them in greater quantities in the interests of acquiring a greater material understanding of the good life. Taking the methods shaped by the principles of scientific management of human activity as utilized first in the training and field operations of the Prussian army, industrialists in Europe first and then later in the United States sought to raise up, train, and then utilize a mass labor force to realize their dreams of harnessing for the purpose of mass production the abundant available energy from coal and petroleum. Educated men would, of course, still be needed to receive a traditional, we might say a classical education for upper management positions and also to supply the nation with its statesmen and professionals. Nevertheless, a traditionally educated adult was seen as a liability for the kind of worker needed to provide efficient industrial labor. So the new kind of schooling, based on the principles of scientific management, would have to be created for all but the most intellectually talented and gifted. And if there is anything that I think is probably the strongest legacy in our culture from this vision, first inaugurated in Prussia in the first half of the 19th century, is to overthrow the notion that every child has a right to become an educated person, regardless of their intellectual gifts and talents but rather the question of who best to be educated, subsumed under an understanding of what would be in the nation's best interests. Efficient, repetitive work, unquestioned obedience, and the belief that their labors would bring for them a secure, better standard of material living would need to be instilled into children by a new schooling, not an education, a schooling designed to achieve just such outcomes on a mass scale. Discerning well-educated men so previously needed on the family farm and for that matter in local entrepreneurial trades would be a liability for this work. This labor force needed to unquestioningly obey the production orders from above, not to problem solve or to consider if their labors were, for that matter, the best way of doing things. In order to raise up such a system of schooling, adequate funding and legal constraints would be needed. The industrialists partnered with state and federal governments to establish an ever-centralized system of compulsory government-sponsored schooling. The government passed the laws mandating increasingly longer periods of compulsory school attendance in terms of time out of the year and years out of the lives of the children. And the industrialists with their wealthy foundations paid for the creation of the school system and the specific teacher education programs 
that would be needed to implement this on a grand scale. The federal government had no financial resources to put something like this into place. It was all funded by the incredible wealth of your turn-of-the-century industrialists, the foundations of which, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundations, and so forth, still are the major money innovators of progressive education even to this day. Because of the fear of what was called overproduction, we indicated that probably the most modern term for what was meant by overproduction is the word competition. Child labor laws were passed to keep young idealistic youth from providing an abundance of competition that would put to risk the investment of the large sums of capital necessary to get the industrial vi vision off the ground. Moreover, the basic language skills that are introduced and honed through reading would have to be dumbed down and taught at a much more relaxed pace. The point being is that the entry to becoming an educated person and how that occurs as fast, as quick, as inexpensively, and as efficiently as possible is through learning how to read. They understood this. And especially after 1920, during the 20th century, of course, those dumbing down, relaxed reading objectives in schooling were put into place. By about 1960, a monolithic system of progressive government-sponsored education was in place in all of our states, in all of its regions, urban, suburban, and rural. It took about a hundred years for this to occur, beginning after the Civil War, particularly in the major metropolitan centers in the Northeast, particularly in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. Moving westward, but into industrial areas first, and then moving to the middle part and rural parts of the country. It wasn't until about 1960 that I think you could say North Cornstalk, Iowa was pretty well under the umbrella of the program. The independent one-room schoolhouse under local governance that taught children together of various ages and abilities had become by 1960 a thing of the past virtually everywhere. Our session here, though, is devoted to an assessment of the history of progressive government-sponsored compulsory education, particularly of it during the 20th century. In response to criticisms about the mediocrity of American public school system, Walter Green protested what he called the myth of our failing schools and wrote in the Atlantic Monthly in 1998, about that school system. We just happen to have the world's most productive workforce, the largest economy, the highest material standard of living, more Nobel Prizes than the rest of the world combined, the best system of higher education, the best high-tech medicine, and the strongest military. These things could not have been accomplished with second-rate systems of education. It's an interesting observation, and like many interesting observations, usually they are at least half true, and this one is. There's kind of a paradox here. The paradox really is that only a second or possibly a third-rate educational system could accomplish these things. That is to say, uh, prior at least to 1980. We mentioned 1980 pretty much as a watershed as uh, marking at least a good period of time upon which the whole rationale uh, for which progressive education was established 
became anachronistic, at least as a national goal and objective, as about 1980, we ceased to be a country whose economy was based on manufacturing. Uh, and so therefore, the factories, the steel mills, uh, and so forth pretty much are a thing of the past. And so the whole purpose for which government-sponsored education was created uh, in 1980 and onward progressively has been an educational system without a purpose and a goal, at least as it was originally constituted. Therefore, it has been seeking to try to find some sort of role for itself and becoming, of course, a political football uh, of many forces, both in relationship to politics, administration, and as if you saw the movie, of course, teachers unions. Uh, but in any event, by 1980, I think uh, it's safe to say that the original purposes for progressive education, as it was originally conceived, uh, became, as it were, a task the training of a task which no longer existed, at least within the context of our nation. But nevertheless, the progressive system of schooling, that whole system, I think we have to say, did indeed accomplish, probably far beyond even the dreams of its first dreamers in the 19th century, the goals and objectives that it set out to accomplish. It did raise up an effective and efficient mass labor force that did indeed incredibly efficiently and effectively harness the energies of coal and petroleum <coughs> to produce a standard of material living never before reached in the history of the world. So the idea that somehow a goal and objective was understood and careful study into an understanding how, of how to efficiently and effectively meet that goal through schooling, I think we have to say it was a grand success. The program worked. It especially worked well given that the third world had yet to industrialize and as we review history in the first half of the 20th century, we understand, of course, how the Western economies in Europe were decimated by two world wars during the first half of that century, leaving, of course, our utilization of those methods as being certainly very advantageous. It was John Gatto who put it succinctly when he noted Green's confusion, though, between education and schooling. For as Green, who said, uh, could not be accomplished with second-rate systems of education. Rather, our material prosperity, affluence, and power came about through schooling, not anything that was devised to be even in their own thinking as education. Said Gatto, the truth is that America's unprecedented global power and spectacular material wealth is a direct product of a third-rate educational system upon whose inefficiency in developing intellect and character it depended upon. If we, educate, if, if we educated better, we could not sustain the corporate utopia that we have made. Schools build national wealth by tearing down personal sovereignty, morality, and family life. It's a trade-off. And that's exactly what occurred. The continuing problem has been the virtual ignorance, of course, about the goals and objectives that we have outlined that form the rationale behind progressive schooling as it was established and matured throughout the 20th century. The major resistance, of course, to the program as it began and first involved in the Northeast, but then also leapfrogging also into the West, from the urban centers to the rural hamlets, the, the main antagonist to this program during its first 50 years 
say the first uh, the, the first three decades in the 19th century and the first do two decades in the 20th century were the parents. Parents, generally speaking, have always wanted their children to receive an education. And they have wanted that education to be able to pass on to them what would be considered to be the brightest and the best of what they themselves have received. That they might make of their life something of the visions of what parents would be having for them. This, of course, was not the objectives, nevertheless, of progressive education. As for the most part, though, they were resourced uh, or they went up against the opposition and for the most part the opposition was resourced by educators, industrialists, and government officials. And I think it's pretty much safe to say across the country, regardless of where the battle was and what time period we are talking about, the parents not only lost the war, they lost virtually every single battle along the way. Unwittingly and tragically, though, there is another element to this story which I think those of us uh, particularly connected with Christian education almost have to shake our heads in shame and disbelief. But unwittingly and tragically, many influential religious leaders in the American Protestant denominations enthusiastically endorsed the establishment of the legal foundations for this particular government-sponsored compulsory education, and they did it to counter the influence of Roman Catholic education and their school system. There is perhaps no better place to view, of course, this alliance that on the one hand had secular utopians and Protestant churchmen on one side and Roman Catholicism, its officialdom and its school system on the other side, battling throughout most of the first half of the 20th century and at least since I lived there, also I can attest to it, uh, at least through the 1960s, uh, over culture, over the education system, was in the city of San Francisco. And you can tell that by at least the end of the 1960s, the Catholic force had finally and completely been routed, giving you the city of San Francisco, uh, uh, evolving as we know its culture and its character today. It is what, of course, that kind of a situation, though, that we confront today. Most generations of regular folk, especially after the Second World War, have been completely, let me see, I'm getting my pages mixed up, yeah, have been completely ignorant of the history of American education. This, unfortunately, is true also of those who have gone through teacher education programs in our colleges and universities, and this includes also our Concordia University system. Throughout my entire three-decade tenure uh, at Concordia River Forest, no course uh, in the history of American education was required of our teachers. So the things of which we are just briefly overviewing here are not a part, okay, uh, of teacher education, uh, either in the context of our secular campuses here in the latter part of the 20th century, or for that matter, in our own uh, university system. The history of American education is simply not taught. The common belief that is held by most parents and teachers today and it matters not whether they're serving in, uh, in, in public schools today or, or in church-related schools the, uh, or the parents uh, who send their kids there. It is the commonly held belief uh, on the part of most that the innovations that have come on the scene in the name of educational reform have been advanced for the sake of improving the effectiveness of the education of our children. But as you have been able to see, uh, most do finally today 
uh, understand or are beginning to understand that this is simply not the case. The old education and its strategies and methods were not replaced with a system of compulsory schooling designed to do the job of educating our children in a superior, more effective manner. It was quite the opposite. The purpose of the compulsory government-sponsored schooling system was to retard and dumb down learning, to restrict the educated classes to simply the brightest and the best, and to relegate the rest of American children to becoming efficient, effective laborers, to produce and consume ever-increasing quantities of the very goods that they manufactured. And now, of course, those goods almost do not exist. Rather, now it is to consume the services, including, of course, more and more services that would fit generally under the heading of entertainment. The fact is, we now produce almost nothing uh, anymore as we no longer are able to compete in the manufacturing world in a global economy. Today, our schools are the product of startling incompetency due to both the vacuum of a past bygone industrial age and the paralyzing power of teachers unions. It has become often for that matter within state levels of political football in terms of what it would mean to have our schools doing something of course that would be advancing of course, the national good. We still believe that education ought to be serving the goals and objectives that should be understood as collectively good for everyone. And so ideology okay, is having a tremendous influence upon an understanding of what education ought to be or what our schooling ought to be and do so much today. We no longer, of course, have the factories and the mills needed for a mass labor force. Since the close of the 1970s, the productive energies of American industrialization and the dream of utopia went into rapid decline. And this has been the case, of course, for several reasons. First, I would like to suggest one of the reasons why it has been in decline is because of a disenchantment about what it would be like to live with the achieved goals. I count myself as one of those who came along to reap the benefits of not only this kind of an education, but the utilization of just that kind of a mass labor force, who achieved the greatest material increase over the previous generation through this entire product. Those of us who were born at the very close and for the decade or so after the conclusion of World War II. Those of us known as the baby boomers. Those who were raised by parents who had very little because they were raised in the Depression in the first two world wars and they were convinced that their children would be raised getting everything in plenty of which they just had a little. This was, of course, my generation. And we hit the college campuses during the middle 1960s. And we wished to say, in every type of venue, of course, upon which we could raise our voice, it is empty, it is hollow, and it does not fulfill the human spirit. If we want to think of statements made, okay, if you... I realize that uh, for some this may be just reaching back into history, but there are powerful statements of this that were made by my generation back then uh, in song, contemporary music, cinema. The first statement of this which transformed Hollywood and put it on the track that it is still clanking down the tracks on was uh, the movie that was made uh, in 1969 that launched Dustin Hoffman's career. It was a comedy. Simon and Garfunkel did the music for it. It was called The Graduate. It was the comedic 
version of this. As Benjamin was my contemporary, raised with everything, who could think of nothing meaningful in life other than the escapist activity of shacking up uh, with Anne Bancroft. If we wanted to think of the, of the biting, strong statement of the point, made also by Dustin Hoffman, I might mention, just six months later, a movie that isn't shown very much, but wished to make the same point without the laughs, was the movie which also launched John Voight's career called Midnight Cowboy, exactly. Or listening to the music of Simon and Garfunkel. Or back when she was alive, because she didn't live very long, Janis Joplin, the big brother in the holding company, who sang the words of Chris Christopherson before he became a Christian, freedom is just another word because you are nothing if you are not free. It was the counterculture of the 60s which wished to proclaim that the utopian visions of the industrialists that launched this schooling system achieved their materialist goals, okay, but they did not satisfy the human spirit. And since that particular time, progressive education has been, as it were, a system and a financial structure that keeps perpetuating itself that has been trying to find a reason and a purpose. Many are very interested, of course, and desirous that somehow that it would be able to reform itself and to get back to the task of truly educating our children. Uh, if you saw Waiting for Superman, you certainly saw parents uh, in very mean urban contexts, okay, who desired this so much for their children and at the same time felt that two things were the case. Number one, and this is the most tragic thing, they did not feel that they were a part of the resources. That's the unspoken part in the movie, but so well depicted. That here was a generation of parents who understood so much more clearly everything that their children needed, and there was absolutely no question that they had no resources upon which to provide it. And those upon which perhaps the government might be able to reme remediate that in relationship to schooling opportunities were rare uh, and obvious devastating uh, those who didn't win the lottery uh, to get their kid in the one school uh, that was trying to do something positive. So as has been that particular case, I uh, would like to bring up also uh, our conference theme this year, which is meant to challenge us to consider the most fundamental question and not make the mistake all over again of the industrialists in the 19th century. The good life is not the consumption of material things. It is not made up of the greatest standard of living. And then to add in, of course, the latter part of the 20th century, which is almost outstripping consumptionism, okay, is entertainment. Where you spend your money and how much money you can make in the area of entertainment outstrips just about most everything else other than hedge traders today. This tells us something about, it seems to me, where the goals and objectives are today. With nihilistic worldviews, from existentialism to mysticism to postmodernism, which have come on the heels of the nihilistic statement in Europe after World War I, in our own country after World War II, which became standard in the American university liberal arts scene by the 1960s, has raised up generations of Americans 
who are seeking to develop lifestyles and to manage, of course, their material assets in such a way that they are able to maintain lifestyles that are able to cope with lives of nothingness. But to that, though, the question we would raise, why educate? And when I say why educate, I'm, I'm asking that question not in relationship to a service that we would offer, as it were, to the world at large. Why would we educate our children? To what objective? To stimulate that thought, I want to share with you a personal occurrence in my life that made a tremendous impression on me that I think relevant to the question. It was about 38 years ago, and I as a, well, not a young, a younger man, <laughs> walked back with my brother and sister and mother as we laid my father to rest much earlier in my life than I would like to have him to have entered glory. And as we were about to reach the car, my mother came up to me, and we had our suit coats on and everything and she came up to me and she grabbed and twisted the lapels on my jacket and she looked me in the eye and she said son your father and this family are going to be getting back together and in that day you be there and there was no smile on her face Now, for a Christian mother, I would ask this question, and fathers can listen in and you can silently answer it for yourself. If your son or daughter makes it in the fullness of salvation with you, are there any complaints that you would like to launch to the Lord about any and all the sacrifices that you or that kid may have had to have made in order to be there? Of course not. On the other hand, if they don't make it, and if you were to ponder that even right now, what words could I offer you as consolation that you can take with you and in the fullness of salvation, you're going to say, <coughs> perfectly fine. No problem. I would like to suggest one goal then, as an ultimate goal to why educate, in relationship to our baptized children. And I'm trying to change the rhetoric I'm schooled in all the God words. I've used them for centuries. I'm trying to avoid them because you may have associations different than how I want you to take it. So I'm going to put it in street language. All right? That the final ultimate goal in relationship to our baptized children is spiritually speaking, keep them alive. To keep them alive. Don't let them become collateral damage. Here, where the unholy triad, the world, the flesh, and the devil operate. As we think in terms of the vertical, anyways, keep them alive. And you keep them alive by helping them to appreciate two things. What life would be like if lived apart from all of the <coughs> blessings that is theirs because they have been splashed with grace and live with it. Something, of course, the prodigal son did not know when he left home. What would it be like? If we are baptizing our children as little small ones, they can't go to personal experience to be able to answer that question. Prodigal son could, out there with the pigs and the pods, 
eventually, but we're not particularly wanting to set up a program for our children to go and do likewise. Right? But nevertheless, we're going to have to impress upon them that they have a spiritual sickness unto death. And they will continue to have to deal with that to either the day they check out of this world or Jesus checks back in, whichever one happens first. And there is but one regimen alone that will keep them alive. And that's the grace of Christ that he brings in word and sacrament. That's it. It's the only program. So they need, as we Lutherans understand, they need to die to sin daily and be raised up again by God's free grace. They need to be able to live the life of baptism, not just remember it, the daily dying and rising. And I like to compare this to a particular disease that has a very high child mortality rate. Diabetes type 1. An unbelievably high percentage of these children die. And not that we don't understand anything about diabetes, and not that we somehow have a technological problem here or an understanding of what is absolutely necessary in order to live a very happy, normal life. This balance between insulin and blood sugar and the abundant supply of the insulin and the incredibly easy delivery systems for it, but to impress upon the child the discipline that is necessary to keep them in balance. You just don't need insulin whenever, however. And you just don't need blood sugar whenever, however. You need them in balance. And when they get severely out of balance, you die. And it doesn't matter which one is out of balance. Both without the other will kill you. You can die by the law without the gospel. But what Lutherans often do not understand is you can die by the gospel without the law. Because you can die of malnutrition in a restaurant if you don't eat, if you're not hungry. They need to be in balance. So it's law, gospel, and then a life lived with God's purposes. It's dying and rising. It's sin and grace. Not whenever, however, for the golden objective of keeping them alive because they have a sickness unto death. And they will not be rid of that problem in this earthly existence. Now the idea that somehow we would wish to communicate this to a three-year-old putting their name on a spiritual turtle strung down in the church basement called cradle roll or whatever else and then throw them into a class with bunnies and finger painting and flannel graph. If the medical profession did this to those with diabetes type 1, there would be suits of malpractice. For the the medium would be canceling the message. Hmm? There is a difference between the simple gospel, where the word simple means basic and trivial. And we in the church often have misunderstood the difference between that which is primary and basic over against the notion of what is trivial. And I believe progressive education has helped us with that vision. For they have purposefully sought to trivialize at the youngest of ages. It was a part of the social program. It was not to raise up smart, intelligent, uppity, ready to take on the world and with the skills to be able to do it, young adolescents. 
Up until 1920, particularly in the 19th century in American literature for children, issues of life and death were the most popular thematic subjects of literature written specifically for children. By 1920, no children's literature focused on those themes. There is nothing more basic than life and death. And the third issue, of course, which Christianity wishes to deal with, and I would say these are, for that matter, the hearts of a classical education, okay, is to introduce children into the great conversation to both become aware of, head, to appreciate heart, the struggle for clarity on the answers of these three questions which, op which focused the great conversation from Greco-Roman times on forward. What is life? What is death? In the face of the problem of death, how do we secure the future? The ancient Greeks and Romans could wax eloquent on the first two questions. And it's why we, if we don't read them, it's hard to call you a learned person. But to the third question, in the face of the problem of death, how can the future be secured? They had no answer. So when Christianity hit the scene with the message of the empty tomb, they entered into the great conversation in Western civilization in the Mediterranean world. They got up on the podium and they said, we have an answer to the third question. And that was intellectually speaking what turned the world upside down in the Mediterranean world in the first two centuries A.D. And when Christianity entered upon the scene, it was not therefore understood as a religion so much as it was understood as a philosophy. Religions didn't produce wisdom about things like that. Okay, That was the purview of philosophy. Keep them alive. That, I think, is the vertical element. To bring about an awareness and an appreciation of the freedom of grace. But then the converse element on the horizontal, okay. first on the vertical to liberate the person from sin, and on the horizontal to liberate them from themselves. And enter into, if I could use uh, a, a Luther term, but not how he used it but how he uh, talked about it in the freedom of the Christian, the bondage of the neighbor. Vocatio bounds the life of faithfulness that flows from faith to the neighbor. We serve Christ in the neighbor's need. So it is the goal to be a good steward of that which God has given to you to be of some earthly good not for your benefit, for your neighbors. For in your baptism you have received an inheritance and a promise that Christ has taken care of you for eternity. And that frees you up then to begin to draw your attentions and focus them upon the number twos, number threes, and all the other numbers that God brings to you in your life. The freedom of grace and the bondage of the neighbor looking at Christian citizenship not as Augustine, not just as simply that we are citizens of the, of the city of God, just a pilgrim people. No, we are also citizens of this world. That Christ has not abandoned this world. He is Lord not only in relationship to his church, but he is Lord also in all of the temporal orders of life. He rules one by grace and the other by law. This was Luther's, of course. When Luther discovered, of course, and set forth this understanding of the two governments, and when he understood, of course, that while Augustine was right, that we are saved by grace through faith alone apart from works, 
because of human depravity. He parted company with Augustine when he, uh, when he left Augustine's moral model of grace for a forensic understanding. When grace was no longer understood as an infused, as an infused divine reforming power which progressively makes us righteous to an understanding that the righteousness of the Christian is a donated righteousness, an alien righteousness which Christ gives to us that belongs to him that we receive and cling to by faith through the word. Then Augustine is pretty well left behind. And that doesn't happen, well, <coughs> scholars wonder. <laughs> um, I like to think that he leaves Augustine behind by the Heidelberg Theses. But some might say it's, it's a little bit later. 1518, anyway. Uh, but in any event, it seems to me, sketching out this question, why educate? And if we were to answer it, regardless of what kind of language you put it to, okay, and that is that they might continue to live and grow in their baptismal grace, that by all means, okay, when Christ gathers his church, they will be there. And to equip them, okay, for a life of being good stewards of what God has given to them, to be of some earthly good, serving Christ in the neighbor's need. This is what I would like to suggest anyways, because it then what I'm hoping will elicit a question, all right, if that's it, and you sold me on that, how can we best do that? Then I think classical Lutheran education has something to speak to. Well, this is how I think. We can take the wisdom of those who have gone before us, okay, and we can build on that. Korchak's book is going to make the case that you can boil that down into two component elements in terms of what Wittenberg came up with as an answer to just that question. How best to do this objective right here? And that is the classical liberal arts, and catechesis. That's how best. Catechesis to nurture our heavenly citizenship and the arts in order to make us good stewards that we might be of some earthly good serving Christ in the neighbor's need. And that therefore the rationale is to say as best as we are able to understand this is what we think is the best that we need to do. The only thing we need to answer is a question we lost with my generation. And we've got to get it back and we've got to figure out how to do it. And that is the question, who should we teach? Our answer for the last 40 years, and I'll put it bluntly, we teach whoever is going to provide the money that we can keep the school going. That's who we teach. And we'll tell you about mission on the basis of how we see the demographic in relationship, socioeconomically, age of kid, you name it, okay? It's Jesus for them. And we need to get back to the very reason that Korchak's book will say and back up, and this is an astounding thesis that he has in this book. Okay, it overturns all of the recital history that we have received about why they came over on the boat here, those Saxons. No, it was not a Lutheran pilgrim journey. It was not that they were poorly persecuted and they came over here so they could worship with good confessional Lutheran theology. Could have been a reason in Prussia with the Prussian Union they were persecuted very much there and were compromised, but not in Saxony. They had total control in their churches. And says Korchak, it was not because you had almost a thousand people getting on the boat as if they were Jim Jones mesmerized, okay, drinking the Kool-Aid of Martin Stephan. 
in relationship to some sort of charismatic figure that hoodwinked them all. Only when they get over here to go, what did we do? But he makes the case. What these pastors and parents did not have control over was not their worship life, but it was education. They didn't have control of the schools. They had influence, but they had no control over the curriculum or the teachers that would be hired or retained. And it was the influences, particularly of rationalism, that their children were getting in the school. Oh my God, if we could just go back to rationalism. <laughs> You know, it's kind of like saying, wouldn't it be great if Clinton was still in office? Right? <laughs> um, but they, they, had, they reached this conclusion, okay? And that was this. If it is just your divine service and what can pastors can provide in their parish in relationship to the goal of keeping the kids alive in their baptismal covenant, they could not efficiently and effectively catechize their children with that kind of a school system. And they came over here for the schools. It was the schools. It was the education of their children. They did not believe that they could effectively catechize their children to keep them alive if their children had to be enrolled in those schools. That's why they came here. That's astounding. Okay. But it is to say the answer that they gave to the question, why educate? They considered to be so paramountly challenged by a school system that was far more in harmony with the educational goals and objectives that we would affirm than what we are dealing with today. So why educate, or the question of who educate? It seems to me we've got to get back to this particular point. We educate, we teach our own. We educate our own. Some congregations out in the Pacific Northwest, through events which are strange and marvelous, came out of Pentecostalism and they all converted uh, to Wittenberg Lutheran theology of the cross. I've been teaching out there for about five, six years now. First time I went out and uh, they said, well, we have a school. Would you talk to our school? We understand you're interested in classical education. We'd like to hear more about that. Would you share about that? I said, yeah, sure. So I was out on a Friday and school was going to be out and getting ready to go into a room, I guess, where I was going to talk. And I met one of the ladies who introduced themselves. And I said, well, um, uh, how many are in your school? And she says, oh, we, I think this year we have about 35. Now, oh, that's interesting. Um, and then I asked her this question. What grades do you have? And she looked at me. It just took her aback. She, well, I, uh, and, and just completely blanked out. And she said, well, um, the grades we need. We teach our own. And another lady kind of overheard that, kind of walked over and said, oh, Martha, you know, I don't think we have anybody on fifth grade level this year, do we? And I think Bobby, I think he's the only one on ninth grade level. They began <coughs> with first an understanding of who we teach. Then they dealt with the question, why teach them? And then the third question, which I was astounded to see, when all of a sudden I was marched into the room to talk to, quote, the faculty of these 35 children, okay? And they have, you know, the fold-up tables, you know, set up into the horseshoe, and you've got the chair there, you know, up, up front in the middle. And I just do a little quick count. There are 19 adults sitting around. And I'm thinking, 35 kids, we got... Well, we begin with introductions. And, you know, it doesn't take about seven or eight where I realize, well, who are these people? Well, for the most part, 
they're the parents of these children. And if they're not parents, well, they're grandparents or uncles or whatever. They're connected in with the parish anyways. And each one talks about some element at some level of the educational instructional program with their children that they have, have apparently some expertise and are plugging in on. And they get around back over to this corner over here, and they come to two younger gals there. And one is she introduces herself, and well, she does first and second grade. And then the next one, she introduces her, well, she does third grade. And just after the introduction of the second gal, someone over here on this side pipes up and says, yeah, and we pay them too. We teach our own. What are we going to use as a resource? Well, whatever we have. We'll use the resources that we have, and we're going to do it because we know who we're going to teach, and we know why we're going to teach them. And then we're seeking to find simply what are the best resources in terms of pedagogy, persons, and facilities that God has given us, and we just do it. Mm -hmm. Well, let me throw it out to you. What do you think? Why educate? Could you repeat the session for me? <laughs> <laughs> well, the argument could be made that you uh, educate your own on your own, and you can do that exclusively with the school system. I mean, that's what the nuclear extended family was originally for. I mean, I look at my son and nephews, and they learned a tremendous amount from their grandfather. Sure. Sure, an understanding of a multiple environment in which that's taking place. So, I mean, do you have to depend on the school for everything? I mean, we're a, we're a society now where we feed them breakfast, lunch, and dinner in the public se sector, take care of them on the weekends, take care of them after school. Parents are absolutely minimized. Um, you don't have to do that. Mom can stay home when they're little. Dad can work two jobs to uh, afford things that are important if you have to have a financial situation so mom can raise the kids. Do we have to buy into the public system? Do we have to buy into a parochial system? I mean, just do you, do you? Some have thought, you know, it's good to buy into, you know, the dismal scene of public education doesn't going on everywhere. Some of them have pretty good schools. And test scores will show this out. The broad picture may be really dismal, and some Christian parents may say, you know, we've researched this a little bit, and in terms of where we happen to live, there are some really first-class public schools in the Chicago area. Okay, you go ahead and take the Hinsdale School District, uh, New Trier, uh, whatever else. These are top-drawer schools that send, you know, 95% on to college and their test scores are way up here and they think, look, maybe this would be our best option for our kids, right? As if really it's the poor public schools that really are the bane. I'd like to suggest that we might consider the best schools to be the biggest problem. That is to say, all education, of course, no education is innocent of any attitude toward man and his purposes. All government public institutions teach all subjects where meaning, purpose, and value, generally speaking, are formed by the absence of God in his revelation. In many places, they are legally required to do so. And they teach students how to be socialized, devoid of the moral absolutes of the Creator. And in many of these instances, it may well be the, many, the very effective and competent public schools are schools upon which teach students effectively learn, just as they have been taught. Yes? Um, I'll, I'll just quickly say that that's sure. absolutely true. I, I'm probably one of the younger people here, and I went to yes, Luther, Luther Brookfield School and then public high school in Corvallis, Oregon. Yes. I like to talk about the Pacific Northwest a little bit. Yeah, okay. But um, <coughs> I, I think the gentleman over here was more talking about homeschooling, and I would like yes, to he just, was. you know, what, what you said.
said, I don't think needs an addendum from me. Thank you very much for your words. But I think there is a compelling reason to um, want, and, and to, I guess, to opt for the parochial model, and that is that the baptismal community of the congregation sure. sanctifies yes. and incorporates the natural yes. family. Yes, yes. And I, I am that. totally in agreement with you when, where, and how that may be available. Right. Okay. And I'm, I'm not disagreeing with yeah. what he's sure. saying. Sure. And, and what I want to do is to take both of your comment, okay, and bring these two together. And notice the language I used. I didn't say, I teach my own. Mm -hmm. I said, we teach our own. Okay, Hillary, where's the village? <laughs> okay, and I'm not, and the we, the we is not necessarily the village. Right. But the we is the people it's of God in this place. It is we who have, yeah, who are gathered together around word and sacrament here. In fact, that particular type of a thing, which we call a congregation, mm -hmm. the first thing they did establish was a school. Right. You realize, when we were talking about Muhlenberg, and the father of American Lutheranism died at the very point of the birth of our nation constitutionally there in 1787. It is a watershed year upon which American Lutheran historians kind of take stock from Lutheranism, colonial America obviously, to then charting American Lutheranism as the nation we then created. So historians love to take stock at that particular point in time. And uh, among the 13 states making up the Union, uh, we had, among all stripes, Scandahoovians, Germans, whatever, okay, about 300 Lutheran congregations served by about 40 ordained clergymen. Did we have a clergy shortage? You bet. But we had 187 schools. So yesterday you spoke of the system that stifled learning. creativity yeah, and learning and yeah. logical thinking. Mm -hmm. Didn't wish, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about recruiting and retaining students, the parents who we're speaking to were brought up in that system. We, yeah, and, and I must confess, Lord, it is I. Okay. But we've been uh, retraining ourselves, basically. Working at it. Right. Working at it. These parents have not been retrained. That is themselves. correct. So for practical usage, how do we take this and what we know to be true and portray that in a way that we get them to logically see this is the best choice for their children? That is the question that I have been agonizing over for seven years now when I had to be the headmaster that not only started my high school, but had to close the doors. Because effectively answering that question to for, for six years, mm -hmm. okay, to try to get the job done to support the you know instructional program, I failed at. I was not and, and, and we had we we just weren't for Lutherans, but you had to be a Christian. We weren't mission outreach, okay? You had to be a member of a Trinitarian, you know, in, in in good standing church. And we had to have a note from the pastor that you just weren't a member, but you were actively a a worshiper, okay? Of all of our six years, the smallest religious group of our students were Lutherans. We had more Calvinists, Baptists, and Catholics that appreciated what we were doing than Lutherans. Now, how did I try at that time to talk about what our school was and how it would be of benefit to their children? I talked about how this was the best education their children could get. I talked about its excellencies, its rigor, wasn't so watered down and how it could do all these things. And the parents and the kids processed this, my words, according to the culture around us. So parents are always thinking, this is a high-powered education. Remember, progressive education thought that a really education, real education, rigorous education, 
ought to be just simply for the brightest and the best. And they're thinking they're Bobby and Susie, okay? They're just average kids, okay? They're not all that bright. So maybe this it wouldn't be right for them. Kid, of course, looks at the curriculum. This is his worst nightmare, okay? <laughs> you know, I mean, he has never thought of an academic hell bigger than what stared him in the face when he looked at what our curriculum was. So uh, I had to deal with those kinds of things. I was least effective with Lutherans about this. Now notice, I changed the rhetoric with you. And if I had to go back to do it again, maybe I'd strike out also. But I'm just trying to figure out how are you going to get through. And I want to get rid of the God words, okay? And I want to ask the parents, okay, if they have any awareness of how the world around them are being marshaled in terms of the unholy triad of the world, the flesh, and the devil to dislodge the faith into which they are baptized. Do they have any concern about it? And I want to sit down and I want to ask them very clearly this question. Would you like your kid to be with you in heaven? Well, of course we would. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. Okay? If your kid was diagnosed with leukemia, would I be insulting you if I asked you if you were interested in plan B, it's a little cheaper. <laughs> would I be insulting you? Yeah, I would. Just even to bring it up, okay? Now there's the best, of course, plan here to keep your kid alive. It's going to require some sacrifices on your part, but then it might not be right for you. We do have a, a plan, plan B okay, here. It's really a third of the cost. It's not as effective. Okay. Might you be interested in I mean they boot you out the door so fast, right? What an insult. If it's a matter of life and death, we spare no resources. Well, it's a matter of life and death. That's what it's about. I, and this is how I'm thinking here, okay? And we've got to start using some straight language about the problem of sin. It's not the issue that we're going to deliver your kid from being naughty <laughs> or doing drugs or whatever else, okay? It's to keep them alive. Counter argument, uh, not mine but it comes from a conversation I had with a classics instructor from Concordia Irvine last October. Um, he um, uh, discussing uh, uh, education, where to educate, who gets educated, and why, uh, separated the, um, the uh, educational task from the catechetical task as one's kingdom of the left and one's kingdom of the right. Um, and did, was reluctant to in, in, engage or make a catechetical task part of the task of education. So if you do that, or if you buy into that, um, it, it doesn't matter whether they go to the public school or to right. the reformed classical yes. school or wherever. Right. And that's to misunderstand, of course, how the Christian is the citizen of both to be lived under the Lordship of Christ. Okay. Uh, the child is not bifurcated. The life of faith and faithfulness in both kingdoms is lived where we live, work, and play. Uh, well, our time is up. I just hope that this is able to whet your appetite anyways to further think through these. I'm continuing to do so, like the farmer trying to get that row straight. How is it that we can talk to our own people in a meaningful way to understand the importance and the value of this education that we see as so vitally helpful and important in the lives of our children. Thank you very much. Thank you.